Hi, my name is Eli Senesh. I'm um, speaking on behalf of a group that includes both myself and Alex Lev, who actually wrote a quite substantial portion of this work. So I'm presenting jointly since he just presented. Well, he didn't want to prepare two presentations, so. <laughs> All right, I'll be presenting on our abstract semantics of probabilistic program traces. That's the first one. And a convenient category of tracing measure kernels. That's the second one. So a language for inference is often a language for inverse inference, really. We want to set up a probabilistic model in which we sample an unobserved variable, make some prediction about data, observe data that we can compare to the prediction, and then use the inverse probability rule or Bayes' law to get a posterior distribution. Unfortunately, that tends to involve solving an analytically intractable integral, can't necessarily be done in closed form, and so in practice, what we end up doing is writing an approximate inverse model, which we use to sample the unobserved variables, assign some kind of scalar weight, and then take a, damn, uh, sorry, there's a missing marginal probability factor in the right side of that equation. I fixed it on my laptop. That set of slides did not get transferred, okay. And then the average over the weighted samples gives us a Monte Carlo approximation of the true posterior distribution. In practice, that often tends to result in a computation graph like the one seen at the bottom here, which should actually have a figure caption on it. Are we zoomed in somehow? Actual size. No, what? I think you should just roll with it. Yeah, well. Success. Okay, yes. Right, okay, so. Yes, in practice, the computation graph often looks like this, where we're feeding in data, we get out samples for the unobserved variables, we feed those back into the generative model in order to score them and generate predictions. The particular example chosen here is of course a variational autoencoder because it's the simplest case in which we tend to apply what we're now calling amortized inference. Of course, when we go to give semantics to these things, we're going to run into some trouble almost immediately in the sense that if we model programs as unnormalized measures or probability measures given some parameters. And then we want to pass to a higher order probabilistic programming language, one with first class functions, lambdas, the whole toolbox. We find that the space of functions from the reals to the reals is not measurable or viewed in another way, the category of measure spaces is not Cartesian closed. So what we tend to do in practice is say, let's take our operational model of assuming that there's an infinite random number generator stream, put that in some base sample space omega, and construct a nice categorical setting in which we can push forward samples from this uniform stream to get the probability measures we want. And the particular setting that we're focusing on today is based on a lot of good work by a number of people, some of whom are in this room, on quasi-Borel spaces. And technically there, we're working in a probability monad. So if you read appropriate math symbols, you can see on the left that yes, we're working in the Claisley category of the probability monad of the category of quasi-Borel spaces. If you don't care about that, well, our actual contribution is that in real probabilistic programming languages, particularly higher order ones, the stream of random variates is not just an implementation detail, it often gives us a data structure we call a trace over which we want to evaluate a density for inference purposes. And our two abstracts today are based on different ways of reasoning about the semantics of those traces and densities. Sorry, uh, question. So why do you this problem despite its finite dimension of an uniquely identified function? Sorry, why do we worry about the problem? About the um, quasi borel space, because Q phi is uniquely determined by phi, right? So if you have a higher order function, 
Yeah, sorry, by parameter I meant X or Z. Like, like what do you, I, I don't. So Q, I think the problem here is higher order functions are not measurable, right? But phi um, in, for the variational autoencoder is finite dimensional. We can use that to identify the function. So I'm just trying to understand. So technically you could also use a finite number of parameters in order to write down, say, a way to sample a lambda expression from a grammar. But again, if that lambda expression has type R to R, then it is, we need a space to actually map it into. So, you know, it's the syntax semantics problem. You can have a finite dimensional random object, which is finite dimensional in terms of its syntax, grammar, lambda calculus, function expression. But then if you want to ask, what is this mathematically, semantically? Well, it's a function from one space to another space, and we need a space of measurable, or in our case, quasi-measurable functions to model that. All right, so I had mentioned amortized inference earlier, and what we're typically going to want to do there is to feed some data into this approximate inverse model Q. We get a trace tau out. That trace contains an address Z with some data, some real numbers, and a symbol there. I'll come back to what those are later in the talk. And then we're going to use the trace tau scored under the program P, given the X, to calculate a variational objective. And the point of a variational objective is that when we find some local optimum by gradient descent, coordinate descent, some other method, we're going to have set the phi, those parameters, to give us the best approximation to the true posterior available within this approximating family. That's amortized variational inference. All right, so here are sort of short outlines of our two abstracts. In the first one, on the left, we're focusing more on the language that we use to represent higher order probabilistic programs. We set it up so that there's a type of heterogeneous traces and all probabilistic programs we can write in that language are traced from the beginning. We can then talk about correct by construction inference procedures using program transformations. And as a special note, Alex is the first author on that first abstract. And so while I will, of course, continue using the rhetorical academic we throughout the talk, in all talking about that abstract, it really means Alex. <laughs> in the second abstract, a convenient category of tracing measure kernels, we look at the categorical domain in which we are giving semantics, and we ask, can we add traces, likelihood weights, and densities to that domain so that rather than, so that essentially we can map from an arbitrary syntax into this categorical domain and be able to reason about densities, traces, and inference. There we'll be considering inference as change of measure ratios. All right, onto the first abstract. As I had said before, this is Alex Love's work as first author and he simply asked to only have to prepare one presentation for today. Let's see, turning this, trying to turn on this laser pointer because I'm about to use it. Okay, well, aha, okay, yes. So, we're going to start by formalizing a core calculus of trace probabilistic programs in which traces work more or less like how we actually use them in real PPLs. So the calculus is capable of expressing simply typed lambda calculus. We give a measurable space of heterogeneous traces, which is a somewhat complex construction. And then we can assign uh, pair semantics to each closed probabilistic program, where closed means that it has no free variables. The pairs are those of, on the left, an unnormalized measure over traces, and on the right, a measurable function mapping traces to return values. Then we can derive provably correct program transformations for sampling a weighted trace 
from a probabilistic program in this core calculus, and for calculating the density of a program at a trace under a suitably constructed base measure for traces that gives us pretty much the result we would intuitively expect. So we're going to just breeze through the core calculus a little bit before going on. Ground types are those that can function as the sample space of a primitive distribution in this formalism. Then types are simply the types that can be assigned to data, including, you'll see at the end, both primitive distributions and general measures over arbitrary data. We then have terms, including those of a generic typed lambda calculus, those that we can use to form traces, and your typical monadic sample score return and sequencing operations for the probability monad in functional programming. Here at the bottom, we can show some of the type rules. Um, tracing needs to have something of ground type assigned to each variable. We can concatenate traces. We can sample from a primitive distribution only. And this now has measure type. And of course, we can give an unnormalized scoring factor, which will be exponentiated and has a side effect of altering the measure represented by the program, but does not return a value. Using the program transformations, weighted sampling and density evaluation, we can, under an assumption we'll come back to later, write correct by construction important sampling in due notation. So just reading it out, we're going to sample a weighted trace from the proposal Q, and we're going to assume that this trace lies within the support of the program P as well. So we're assuming that P and Q are absolutely continuous with respect to one another, no missing random variables, no superfluous random variables. Then we can just evaluate the density of the proposal at the trace, the density of the target at the trace, and multiply the incoming incremental weight by that ratio in order to perform important sampling. And remember, this is not in a Haskell library. This is in the core calculus where this is correct by construction. All right, now, as I said about traces needing to have no missing, no superfluous variables, we've done a lot of thinking about that and we'll be doing further work together I'd actually like to thank Alex for his contributions to the second abstract, even though he's not on the author list. And we'll be coming back to that issue. So in the second abstract, we consider things entirely on the mathematical side in the category of quasi Borel spaces. So we try to take this trace, which has an address Z. And now I'll tell you what's going on in here. 0.23 is a quantile, an element of the unit interval, or you could think the output of a cumulative distribution function. And then since we have a heterogeneous sample, it's type tagged with the symbol for this support type. So we have a notion of addresses, that's just a countable infinite set. Support types, that's just another countable set. And we can model traces as essentially just partial functions. They're defined at some number of values and they map an address to a quantile and a heterogeneous sample. In our abstract, we show that these form an object in the category of quasi Borel spaces. Now, the quantiles here stick out a little bit because we haven't actually used them for anything yet. What we're going to do is tie them back to the original randomness stream from which every morphism in QBS is drawing and pushing forward its random numbers. So we rearrange the base sample space so that it is addressable. And since the address set is countable rather than uncountable, that actually still leaves it intact as a quasi Borel space, sorry, as a standard Borel space which can serve as the base sample space for QBS. We then give this a neat little name, 
A lazy trace is a probability distribution over these infinite trees. Or we can think of it as a memoized random function mapping addresses to quantiles. And here's where we use the quantiles from the eager traces. We can take quantiles from the eager traces, put them back into a lazy trace, and run a program conditional upon a trace that way. We then say, all right, we want to reason about densities. That means that we have to be talking about measures over finite dimensional sample spaces. We diagram out the property here, which we call randomness projection, which simply says that given an infinite countable set of random variates, we're going to take some finite number of them, assign them addresses, sample values, et cetera, and then use that to deterministically push forward some transformation of the input to get the output. Now, having this notion of an eager trace that we can write down as output, we just use the logging monad or writer monad to write down both that and a non-normalizing weight. This means that we now have a diagrammatic way of writing our nice Markov kernels in our convenient category of measure tracing measure kernels built on the QBS probability monad. Finally, what we can use all that inference state for that we got with the logging monad is to write highly spe is to write general case weighting rules for transforming samples from one program into samples from another program while getting the correct integral at the end. Now, we, call, we note that this forms a category because by forming a category, it also means that these change of measure morphisms compose, which allows us to describe nested sampling techniques as well. In conclusion, we started with a very high level look at tracing and densities over traces in higher order probabilistic programming languages. We then took a pair of approaches, one based on a core calculus and another building on the work on quasi Borel spaces to build up ways to reason about densities and traces so that we can then eventually reason about inference programming in the semantic domain. On the one side, inference programming applies changes of measure, and on the other side, and on the other side, it consists of cor uh, sorry, correct by construction program transformations. Our work was supported by the NSF, took place jointly at MIT and Northeastern, and we look forward to talking to you about it.